Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, let's stand together if you're able to stand. If not, remain seated and follow along as I read, beginning in verse 10. Verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. By the way, let me interject here that that is our theme for this year as a church. That's what we want to do. We want to stand. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We want to stop there and let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. It's a joy to be here today. I've enjoyed the service already. Thank you for the visitors. Thank you for the, the great singing, the special, the piano playing. All of it's been a blessing. Father, we've come to this place where the preaching of your Word takes place. The primary thing we know that you want us to do. And I pray, Lord, you'd fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit. We recognize this morning that without you, we can do nothing. We need you. We need your word. I cannot preach without you. We cannot listen without you. So please bless by your spirit. Speak to our hearts today. I pray if there's someone here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that you would bring great conviction upon their soul. Help them to realize that they need to be saved this morning and how it's a free gift for all and anyone who believe. And then for those of us that do know you, I pray, Lord, as we look at this familiar passage, that we would not take it for granted because, because we've read it so many times or perhaps heard a lot of preaching on it. But we would have the ears to hear that you want us to have this morning. We pray that all things today would bring glory to thee and especially this message. May your word have free course. And we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There is an old familiar adage that has been applied to military combat. It's been applied to sporting games. And it's been applied to many other realms of competition. Uh, technically, it is known as, quote, the strategic offensive principle. And it goes like this. You've heard it before. As I begin to say it, you could probably finish the sentence. The best defense is a good Oh, you've heard it before. And that's true. The best defense is a good offense. And the idea of this principle is that in order to win any contest, any contest, you must, I must, we must be proactive. We must have a strong offensive action because a passive defensive attitude only can never win. Never. It will never do the job. By the way, it's no different in the Christian life. And that is what the Apostle Paul is speaking of here as we deal with this next piece of the armor. You see, we're continuing our journey through this book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians is a letter, of course, written, penned by the Apostle Paul to a church. To a church, the church at Ephesus, of course, we read of this church in the book of Acts, uh, uh, chapter 19 and 20. We read of it in the book of Revelation and in Revelation chapter 2. But it has been about four years since the Apostle Paul has seen these church members and, those, uh, uh, and their pastors, if you remember, on his way to, uh, uh, to Jerusalem on his, at the end of his third missionary journey. He stopped there in Miletus and he met with them and he spoke with them and he said to them these words, I, you'll see my face no more. And it was true. 
And off to Jerusalem he went where he was arrested uh, uh, by the Sanhedrin. He was then uh, shipped uh, to Caesarea Maritime uh, along the coast of Israel where he spent two years there. And then he was shipped from there uh, to, to Rome where he is under house arrest in Rome. Now we read of this house arrest uh, at the end of the book of Acts. If you want to turn there, uh, just to get an idea of what it was like, Acts chapter 28, uh, the very last two verses. We read, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, Acts 28 and verse 30, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And that's how the book of Acts ends. Paul is under house arrest. He is there waiting, awaiting his trial before Caesar, of whom he appealed to uh, some time ago, which is the reason why he was there. Now, while he is under house arrest, uh, awaiting his trial, he is using this time to do two things. Uh, one, as we read in Acts chapter uh, 28, was to minister to all that he could get to come to him in Rome. He was allowed some freedom there under house arrest. He had a Roman soldier chained to him 24 hours a day, but he was allowed to have people come in and see him, and he was allowed to send letters out and minister to people as well. So he used that time to first minister to those that he could get into the house preaching and teaching uh, the kingdom of God, and then he also used that time to write letters. Letters to churches, letters to individuals, and he wrote what we know of as far as scripture is concerned, four prison epistles during this time. One went to the church at Philippi, that's the letter of Philippians, the other to the Colossians, uh, the other to a man by the name of Philemon, and, and then the last, of course, to the church at Ephesus. Now here in chapter 6, if you'll go back there please to Ephesians chapter 6, we are now in the closing portion of this letter to this church at Ephesus and Paul is kind of using these last words to give them a charge. Uh, to tell them to stay uh, strong. Uh, uh, he, he's telling them to continue to be strong and to stand. Notice Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. I already read it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6, 13, I read it again. We read, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. But then he also reminds them in this passage that there is only one way that any of them, any of us, any believer is going to be able to stand in the evil day. There's only one way. And that is for us uh, to put on the whole armor of God. Now, for the past several weeks, we have been looking at all of these pieces. My wife had mentioned to me last week, you should have made a shield when you were talking about the shield and brought it up. A couple other people said the same thing. I thought, well, that's great. Why don't you do it next time? But anyway, <laughs> I got nothing else to do but to cut out cardboard, let me tell you. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, we're talking about this armor. We went through these six pieces and, and we saw the belt, if you will, when he, in, uh, in verse uh, 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. That is the belt of truth. We talked about the breastplate of righteousness in verse 14 as well. We talked about those shoes in verse 15. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then in verse 16, we see the shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Uh, last week, we looked at the helmet uh, of salvation uh, uh, there. And then this week, we're looking at this sixth and final piece, arguably, some would include prayer there. I'll deal with that in a different way. But we've come to this final piece, and notice what it is at the end of verse 17. He says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This morning I want to preach on this subject, stand, taking the sword of the Spirit. What is this sword he's speaking of? Well, he tells us. I'll give you some more details. And why is it so important? Why is this sword so important to the Christian? Well, let's find out. 
Let's consider, number one, the description of the sword. Notice he begins again, and the sword. Here we find the last necessary piece. I say it again, all of the pieces are necessary. He said, take uh, the whole armor of God, uh, and now he's describing this last piece, which is uh, the sword. The sword. Again, there are two aspects he's dealing with here of this piece. Uh, the first one is the physical soldier's sword. Let's talk about that. The soldier's sword. You know, the first five pieces of the Roman soldier's battle gear were all primarily defensive in nature. But the sword here is a, a sword of a soldier is primarily for offense, for the attack. Oh yes, it could be argued and certainly does block things and you could use it for that, but its primary purpose is to attack. You see, a Roman soldier knew, he knew, the army knew that in order to win the battle, we have to be on the offensive. We have to have a good offense. Uh, you see, warfare was not about running from the enemy. Warfare was not about warding off this attack and that attack. Uh, warfare was not about being defensive only. Otherwise, you would inevitably suffer defeat. It was essential for a soldier to seek and to destroy the enemy. And so the Roman soldier had to have effectual weapons of attack. Now, Roman soldiers used three primary weapons in warfare. First one was this, a pylum. A pylum was like a javelin. It was about 4.5 uh, uh, five feet long, had a wooden shaft. Uh, it had a uh, uh, projecting from that, of course. Uh, that wooden shaft was this iron uh, shank, uh, which was pyramid in shape. Uh, and, of course, this would be used to chuck or to throw. It was primarily used for longer distance attacks. He also had another uh, item, a weapon, called the pujo. This was actually a very small dagger. It was carried on the person of the soldier, sometimes strapped somewhere. And that would be used as the last resort weapon when everything else was exalted. He would grab for that pujo that was somewhere there to save his life. But the primary weapon that the Roman soldier used was a weapon called the gladius. The gladius. This was their primary sword. It's from the word gladius, or this sword, that we, got, we get the word gladiator. Now, this was their most powerful sword. This sword was about 24 inches long and perfect, a perfect size for a soldier to wield effectively. They would make sure that this sword was razor sharp. It was actually double-edged. Uh, it was ideal for hand-to-hand -hand combat, all of the hand-to-hand -hand combat that they faced, and it would kill the enemy in an instant uh, uh, if it was used skillfully. Uh, this gladius, uh, this sword that Paul is talking about here, was the soldier's most effective weapon. That's what he's referring to. Imagine how he's there, as he's there under house arrest, looking down the soldier's gear, and he gleans his eyes, if you will, glares at that sword as he's penning these words, and he's talking about this sword of the soldier. But then he not only goes from the soldier's sword, he goes to the saint's sword, because he says this, again in verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So he goes from the physical sword of the soldier and makes a spiritual application here, and he tells us exactly what the Christian soldier's sword is. You and I are given a sword as well. Do you know what it is? It is our spiritual weapon, and he tells us here that it is the Word of God. It is the Bible. By the way, for English-speaking people, that would be our King James Bible. And by the way, this weapon is better than any Roman soldier's sword. 
Uh, read of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. You know the verse. For the word of God is quick and powerful, watch this, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now understand something, as believers, we are not engaged in a physical battle. That's not what our battle is. We are engaged in a spiritual battle. Uh, notice verse 12. I read it. Paul uh, makes light of this uh, in verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We're not trying to beat people up or kill people physically. That's not what it's about. It's against, notice, principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So understand, since we are in spiritual warfare, that requires spiritual weapons. And the one and only weapon that God has given to us is the word of of God. By the way, it's the only weapon that we need. It'll do the job. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the putting down of strongholds. Watch what this does. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of of Christ. This is our weapons, uh, our weapon as an individual Christian, and it is our weapon as a church. You see, a church doesn't need to come up with innovative ideas. We don't need more programs. We don't need new programs. We don't need bigger buildings. We don't have to be on the cutting edge of technology. We're not here to entertain people. You see, the greatest thing that a church can do is to be committed to faithfully preaching and teaching the Word of God. Because it is the Word of God is the weapon that will win every single spiritual battle. And we must be constantly wielding our sword, constantly giving it out. This is the description of the sword. Then number two, I want you to consider the design of the sword. So here we have this, uh, this weapon uh, that we just have to give out and so forth. Uh, what is the design of this sword? Do you know that the Bible, our sword, our weapon is unlike any other book on the face of the earth? Now, that was a good place for an amen right there. I'll give you a few more opportunities. You can take advantage of them. It, it is unlike any other book on the face of the earth. Understand something. If you are holding your King James Bible in your hand, then you are holding the inspired, preserved words of God for English-speaking people right here in your hands. Imagine that for a moment. Uh, this, uh, these are God's words. These aren't man's words. Uh, uh, this is God-breathed. This was breathed out by God. It was inspired. It has been preserved for every generation. And it can do things that nothing and no one else can do on the face of the earth. But do we believe that? By the way, this book's better than a 10-step program. This book is better than a therapy session. Uh, this book is better than some psychobabble book you're going to read. Uh, this book can do things that, that pills cannot do, uh, that religion cannot do. Uh, only the spirit, uh, the sword of the spirit can do it. It's a powerful, powerful book. I want us to think for a moment here as we think of the design of the sword. Some of the things, and there's so many, I'm just going to speak of a few here, so many that the sword of the Spirit does. First of all, number one, it saves souls. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, watch this, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Do you know that the only way that a person can get saved is through the Word of God? That's it. There's no other way. I'll say it again. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God. You see, nobody can be saved without hearing and believing the Word of God. There is no other way. 
They must hear it being spoken. They must hear it being quoted or preached or taught or read it in printed form. There is no other way for a person to get saved unless they hear the gospel which is contained in the word of God. You see, religion will not get anybody's sins forgiven nor give them a home in heaven. A good works won't do it. Obeying the Ten Commandments will not do it. Joining a church will not do it. Just simply believing in God will not do it. They must, people must, hear that they are a sinner destined for hell. They must hear that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose from the dead. They must believe that there's no other way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And they must repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, and then they are born again or born into the family of God. You see, it's when they hear and believe the Word of God that their soul will be saved. I remember when I used to watch, growing up, we would watch football games sometimes, and and uh, I'd see someone kicking a field goal, and behind that field goal would be someone holding a big sign, uh, John 3.16 or John 3.3. And I always looked at that and said, I wonder what that is. I don't, I don't know what that is. Well, it's simple. It's a Bible verse. You see, they understood that you just have to hear it, see it, read it, whatever, and believe it. It's the Word of God that will do the work. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, you see, that is a message that the world needs to hear, and it is found in the Word of God, and this book can save a soul. Amen. So it saves souls. There's another thing it does. Number two, it strengthens the saints. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How does a believer get strong spiritually? It's real easy, by hearing and heeding the word of God. It's that simple. So many people say, well, I wish I had more faith. I wish I was a stronger believer. I wish there was some way I could just be a better Christian. You can, and so can I. If we just immerse ourselves in the word of God, because it is the word of God that will build you up. Acts 20 and verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. I remember years ago, I think I told you this story. We were saved in Mainland Baptist Church, and I was uh, just had some questions about child rearing. And I, and I, and, and I, I think I, as I was walking out of the church, Pastor Bolt was there, and I, I said, you know, I, I want to ask him a question. So I said, Pastor Bolt, what is a, what is a good book on, on child rearing? Here's what he said, the Bible. I said, point taken, I get what you're saying. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting here thinking, just I need a book, I need some kind of solution, I need something out there that will help me. And by the way, many of you are like that. It's the Word of God that will do it. It is the Bible that will strengthen uh, the, the, the saint. This is what it does. Uh, it's going to make you strong. It's going to build your faith. Uh, it's going to make you grow as a Christian. It will give you the boldness that you need. Why? This is what the sword of the Spirit does. It saves souls, and it strengthens the saints. There's a third thing it does. We're talking about the design of the sword here. It also sends conviction. I want you to go over to Acts chapter 5 quickly. Acts chapter 5. You know the story here. Peter is preaching. We have his fourth sermon here in the book of Acts. Uh, of course, uh, Ananias and Sapphira just co committed that sin in uh, chapter 5 at the beginning. And of course, uh, uh, many people, as Peter preaches, get, uh, get saved. And I want you to notice Acts chapter 5 and verse 23. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Notice that short sermon he preached to the Sanhedrin. But notice what happens in verse 33. When they heard that, what did they hear? The word of God. They were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. That's what the sword of the Spirit does. It sends conviction. You see, the Bible does something that we don't like. It shows us where we're wrong. It exposes our error. It reveals our sin. 
It calls things what they truly are with Bible words like sin. Not problems or shortcomings or bad habits. It calls them sin. Fornication. Not cohabitation or living together. Uh, murder, not abortion. Uh, adultery, not an affair. Uh, sodomite, uh, not gay or queer. It's a sodomite. Uh, not, a, uh, not an alcoholic, but a drunkard. You see, the Bible uses strong words. Biblical words are always strong because they're God's words. Words like wickedness and backbiting and tail-bearing. You see, the Bible does this. It shines God's light into areas of our lives that we want to keep dark, that we want to hide, that we want to avoid talking about, that we don't want to address. You see, what the Word of God does, it brings them out into the open. That's why some people won't attend a Bible-believing church. I remember I've talked to several people who've got, uh, when I visited them after coming to our church, and they said, you know, wherever, whenever I come to your church, I always feel guilty. And I say, well, why do you think that? May, and I didn't say this to them. It was a visit, you know what I'm saying? Maybe later. I said, maybe because you're, I'm thinking, maybe because you are guilty. If the Bible says something and you're guilty, and by the way, that's a good thing. Because God's trying to help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means there's some things in our lives we got to deal with. We have to get rid of or add to whatever the, the case may be. But the Bible shines the light on all of those things. That's why we read in John chapter 3 and verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. You see, it boldly tells us things that many people don't want to hear. It tells us of a real, burning, eternal hell. It tells us of the vanity of self-righteousness or religion to get us to heaven. It tells us about the hopeless humanity uh, without Jesus Christ. But it also tells us on the other side of the coin of a loving Savior who will do what only He can do. And that is to forgive us of our sins, to save our wretched souls, uh, and help us in our lives. It tells us all of those things. You know, it's a book when merely read can bring people to tears. I remember one time we were out witnessing it in uh, Chester Springs when we were going to Landmark Baptist Church and I was knocked on the door of a, a girl and, and I told her we're from Landmark Baptist Church and I wanted to give her a track, she didn't want it. And she kind of whispered, she says, I'm Jewish. She said, my whole family is Jewish, I can't take that. I said, well, do you believe the Bible? She says, well, yeah. I said, could I just read you a couple verses? I won't take long, could I just read you a few verses? She said, okay, go ahead. So I started to read to her the Romans road. I went through that, how, how she's a sinner, you know, all of sin and comes short of the glory of God. As I'm just reading God's word, she's starting to tear up, and they're rolling down her face. He said, preacher, you were being mean to her. No, I wasn't. That's the power of the word of God. How many times have you and I been sitting in a service and the preaching of God's word has so touched our hearts that our eyes begin to well up because it's the spirit of God using the sword of the spirit in our hearts to convict us of something that needs to be dealt with. It's a powerful book. I don't know anybody that, uh, that started crying when someone read Tom Sawyer to them or Huckleberry Finn or something, you know. But oh, I know someone who in a novel that I know what you're talking about. I'm talking about conviction though here. I mean, it can break your soul. It can crush you, if you will. And even, it can even do this, as we saw in Acts chapter 5. It can stir up the deepest anger in man. You ever see somebody get angry when you start talking about the Bible? I do. I've seen people I never thought would get angry at me. All of a sudden, it's like the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, peachy keen until you say, hey, something about the Bible. Could I show you from the Bible? I, had, ah, to be <laughs> I don't want to hear about that. My point is this, it's a powerful book. That's what the Bible is. And again, uh, no, no book on earth has been both loved and hated by so many people because of the conviction it produces. So it saves souls, it strengthens the saints, it sends conviction. Then number four, it also solves problems. You know the Bible is God's answer to all of our problems? Amen. It is. You say, preacher, you're being a little bit too simplistic. I don't think so. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That tells me that's all I need. Amen. That's it. 
I don't need anything else. If I have an issue, it will help me through it. By the way, it'll solve this world's problems. It'll solve our nation's problems. It'll solve your family problems uh, if you have a, are having problems with your spouse or your children or your relatives. It'll even solve in-law problems. Man, that's a powerful book right there, amen. It'll help you if you're discouraged today. Uh, it'll help you if you're in, uh, uh, experiencing doubt today. If you have a disagreement with someone, uh, it will help you. Uh, by the way, you want to unite a church, it's really simple. Just agree everyone to submit to the Bible. That's where perfect unity comes from. It's, oh, let's just love and put all the differences aside. That's not going to do it. It's when we agree to unite under the preaching or with the teaching of God's Word. That's how you get unity. It will solve the problems. By the way, you need wisdom. God will give it to you. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. This book will show you how to have a blessed marriage. It'll show you how to raise your children. It'll show you who to marry and not to marry. It can direct you to what school to choose, uh, what music to listen to, what's right dress and wrong dress, what is the right church to attend and a wrong church to attend. And it'll show you why the cults are wrong. Uh, the Bible has all of that. It instructs us in all of life. And then there's one more thing that, the, 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 that does, it does, and that is this. Thir uh, fifthly, it stops temptation. So it saves souls, strengthens the saints, sends conviction, solves problems, and it stops temptation. You know, we're living in a world that's filled with temptation. I mean, there is just all kinds of things around us tempting us. How do we deal with it? How do we get the victory over it? Well, you pick up your bootstraps and you just try really hard. That's not how you do it. Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. Hey, it's just something, you're struggling with something in your life. Do you know the sword of the Spirit's your answer? It's your answer. How did the Lord Jesus Christ, go over to Matthew chapter 4, and I know these are all familiar verses, but we, I need this today, so you can just enjoy or listen while I'm, I'm preaching to myself. Amen. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4, look at the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 1, then was Jesus led up, of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. By the way, that is a temptation. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Here's the temptation to the lust of the flesh. Christ was 40 days in the wilderness. Uh, he was not eating. Uh, he was hungry. And the devil says, you know what? If, you command, command the, if you're the son of God, make these stones bread. Boy, he probably would have thought, boy, I would have filled my stomach up. But he didn't listen. Notice in verse 4. But he answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And it goes on each time in all three cases when the devil tempted him. What did the Lord Jesus Christ do? He used the sword of the Spirit, and we read that the devil fled after he did that. That's how you get victory over sin. Use the weapon that God has given you. Listen, don't try to get victory over your sin uh, in your own strength or with your own methods or, or wor worse yet, using the world's methods. Use God's method. He's given us the sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. My point is this. I said all that to say this. God has given to me and you a weapon. It is the sword of the Spirit. It will defeat every single foe. It is what he has given us. No wonder he said in Psalm 138 and verse 2 that he's magnified his word above all his name. Again, the Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's part of the armor of God. The question is, are we using it? So we see, number one, the description of the sword. We see, number two, the design of the sword. It saves souls. It strengthens the saints. It sends convictions. It, it's conviction. It solves problems. And it stops temptation. And then number three, and finally, let's talk about the duty of the soldier. The duty of the soldier. Do you know that Roman soldier's sword was a powerful weapon? It was designed specifically for him to use and to wield 
But understand something. Its effectiveness was dependent upon the person wielding it. Think about that for a moment. You see, if a, the soldier never used his sword, if the soldier didn't know how to use his sword, or he was incompetent in using his sword, or he didn't continually train with his sword, it would do him very little good. You see, we have a perfect sword, though, don't we? That is the Bible. It's perfect. It's powerful. The law of the Lord is perfect, conser uh, con converting the soul. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is, is tried. So understand something. The problem we face is not the sword. It's the soldier. It's the soldier. You see, if we are going to be soldiers of Jesus Christ, we need to do two things with this sword. Number one is this. Have faith in it. Have faith in the sword. You see, we have to believe, and I wonder today if, we, if, if all of us do, we have to believe that we have God's words. We have to believe that every word is inspired, preserved, it's infallible, it's without error, and it's without contradiction. The question is, do we believe that? Or is it just another book? Is it just a book of suggestions? Is it a book that man just wrote because he needed a religious crutch somewhere along the line? And so is it a book of ideas? Is it something that you and I uh, uh, pick and choose, kind of like going through the, uh, the buffet line where we pick what we like and leave what we don't like? Is that what it's supposed to be? Not at all. And it won't be if you've come to the place where you say, no, I do believe this book is, is inspired by God, preserved, it's infallible, it's inerrant, it's without contradiction. By the way, the Lord Jesus Christ taught that. Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. That goes beyond the words, to the jot and the tittle, the little marks on the letters. And he says, every word is going to be fulfilled, every jot and every tittle beyond the word. He believed it was the word of God. Peter did too. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter didn't say, well, that's just man's writings. Peter didn't say, well, there's some errors there. No. He said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In Proverbs chapter 30, Agur said this, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You see, when we believe that the Bible is the word of God, then we will believe that the Bible is able to do what it says it can do. But do we believe that? I think I mentioned this in Sunday school. I believe the great error of the contemporary church movement is, is that it, it's lost its faith in the Word of God. You know, it's funny, you get in preachers' meetings and they may say, you hear preachers talking, well, how many are you running? How many are you running? How many, you, you know, how many people you got coming? I don't like those questions. I really don't. Because I, God can do a great work with, with a handful of people. He turned the world upside down with what started as 11, well, 12 and one imposter. So it's not about the number. But sometimes they say, or they know, or they say, well, what are you doing? What are you doing there? What are you doing there? How are you doing it? Um, preaching the Bible. That's it. It's, it, it's really, listen, I, I know I am guilty of simplicity. That's okay. I'll be guilty. But you know what? That's what we need. We, we can use more. I'm not saying that. We can't even get the simple things down. We, we need to hear the preaching of God's Word. That's what's going to make it. And the difference, they, they think, in the contemporary movement is they have the idea we have to help God a little bit. By the way, to teach and preach the Word of God takes work. And I think part of it is lazy preachers. That's just my opinion. They just don't feel like working and studying and getting out something so the people can have a meal, if you will. And so they just throw something out. Uh, no, no, no. The main thing for me to do is to preach the Word of God and pastor the people. Those are the two things I'm supposed to do. Preach the Word of God. That's what's going to make a difference in people's lives. Not what we get up here on the stage. I'm not trying to be like the world, uh, to win the world. I'm uh, not the, trying to water down everything and, oh, don't say this about this and don't say this about that. That's an error. That's wrong. We have to have faith in God's Word 
that his word as it's preached can do the work. By the way, it's not always a microwave church that God produces with his word. In fact, it's not. It's a crockpot church. Line upon line, precept upon precept, people growing and growing and so forth. That's what it's about. But that happens as you preach and teach the word of God. But we have to believe that. I, I truly believe this is all we need. That's it, right here. We don't have to do anything special. Just preach the word of God. But we have to have faith in our sword. And then the second thing is this. We have to be able to operate our sword. Can you operate it? Are you skilled in it? By the way, none of us have arrived. None of us. This preacher hasn't arrived. We have to constantly start. You know, in the firearms community, some gun owners and collectors buy what they call a safe queen. <laughs> Ever hear that phrase, a safe queen? A, a safe queen is one of those real expensive guns that's really, really pretty that they never shoot. It's a safe queen. They keep it in their safe and they bring it out to show people. Because it is, it's, it's, it's a novelty, it's a cool looking gun. But they don't, they don't use it, they don't, it looks pretty and all. And they show it to the friends to, to impress them. Again, they talk about it, but they never use it. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But I'm making a parallel here by saying this. The Bible is not a safe queen. It's not a coffee table queen. It's meant to be used. It's meant to be used. And we must, we must continually sharpen our skills. We must continually train. We must continually grow and learn the Word of God. Because it is a perishable skill. It is. You don't work it, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. By the way, that's what happened in Hebrews chapter 5. Let's go there and I'll be done right here. I know, I know your crock pot is telling you the, 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 the lunch is ready. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5 and we're done right here. Look at verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, talking about Melchizedek, and hard to be uttered, seeing, notice, ye are dull of hearing. He's writing to believers. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers. I wonder if there's some people here today. You've been saved long enough. You should be at the place where you could teach the word of God. But you're not. Something's wrong. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk, notice, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. That tells me God wants us to be skillful in the word of righteousness. He doesn't want us to remain babes. We all start as babes, as newborn babes. Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Yes, we all start out as babes, but we must not stay there. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Here's the problem. I said all that to say this. The truth of the matter is, many Christians do not seriously study their Bible. It's true. I can't tell you, 100, and it still rings true, 100% of the time when I have counseled someone, and I've done a good amount of counseling, one of the first questions I've asked them is, I ask them is this, are you reading your Bible and praying every day? Every single time that someone's had a problem, they say, well, not every day. That's just reading it. That's just reading it. That's not studying it. That's not, that's not trying to learn. Very few Christians uh, continually train. Very few Christians uh, spend time sharpening their skills. Somehow uh, we get this idea uh, that my chronology of my salvation uh, equals the spirituality of my salvation. It does not. You can be saved for 50 years and still be a babe in Christ if you haven't sharpened your sword. If you haven't learned how to use it. You see, a few moments in the Word of God each, mor each morning will not cut it. It won't. I wonder how many of us could, if someone asked you, show me a couple verses on the deity of Christ. Could you find them? Or the reality of hell. Could you find them? 
Or how to refute a Calvinist. Could you do that? Could you even list the Ten Commandments or talk about the days of creation and what they are? Most Christians, when they see a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon come into their door, they lock the door and put the blinds down and hide. Wait a minute, we have the sword of the Spirit. This is God's Word. This is God's truth. We, we should be able to use this book uh, to cut any false religion, uh, any false uh, philosophy. But we have to know how to use it. Listen, I have not arrived. Neither of you. But my challenge here is this. Paul talked about the sword. The Roman soldier's sword as his, his weapon. And he says, you've been given a weapon too, as a Christian. The sword of the Spirit. It's designed, it's, it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can cut through anything that this world throws at us. But it's not going to do it by itself. Go get them. It's like me putting a sword there and saying, go get them. i got to learn how to do it. Anybody in the military knows you have to train. Anybody that has any skill, whether it be a piano, a violin, an instrument, anything, understand you have to train, and not just once. You have to train and train and practice and practice and go over it and go over it and go over it and go over it. Why? So you're good at it. You want to be good at serving the Lord? Get into the Word. So I ask you, just are you reading it? Are you training in it? Are, are, are you growing? Are you, are you studying it? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let me throw in another little sharp thing, if, if you don't mind, I'm done right here. In this generation, we have more tools to study the Bible than any other generation in history. We have people that have studied the Word. We have Strong's Concordance. We have all these books. We have computer programs. You can do a Bible search in a second. If there's anybody that ought to know the Word of God better than any generation, we have the complete Word of God. It should be us. Guess what? Guilty. Well, the world is just so bad and I can't do it. Stop. Sharpen your skills. Get confidence in the Word of God. And get out there and fight the fight that God left us here to fight. Amen. That's why we're losing. Because our swords in our, in our sheath. We're not sharpening it. We're not practicing with it. We must if we're going to stand. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.